Well, the first procedure, when we're obviously we've taken the measures, and I'm now I've blocked this cloth to make sure there's no defects in it while I'm looking at it because sometimes although they look over it I've got still got quite a good eye and sometimes you can see things that are not marked so that's the first procedure and then obviously making sure that everything the grain all lines up which that does so there's no no twists in it or anything like that um, and then I then proceed to lay the patterns on in a set piece well not always Depends on the size of the gentleman. Kirby's quite slim, so it's pretty sta straightforward. We start off, this is the front of the jacket, or, well, it's the, what we call the fore part. So that goes on first, making sure that there's a line through that's called a center line. I don't know if you can see that, but that's running exactly square with the edge of the cloth, so there's no twist in the cloth, or, it, or it's slightly on the bias. Then. What we do is I just put a, a blocker on there, which I use shears. I have other things, but it's not a big pattern. And then most important thing is that I leave inlay there, 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 and at the bottom. I don't need anything there, basically. Um, and then I start marking, uh, you know, looking at, at what I'm doing to make sure I, I mirror exactly what I've done when I drafted that I mirror that on the cloth all those little lines and little pitches and stuff makes, must pick up on that pattern which goes on the cloth obviously and then when we try on then I know all those those points will pick up when I take it to pieces again and mark it basically in this case uh, I'll explain that's the four part which is the front we cut with a, what they call a side body panel which is what that is not always, but 99%. Then that's the sleeve, which is not going there. That's the top of the sleeve, this side. And that bit there is the bit that goes under, so it's called the undersleeve. And that's the back. So in the case of this coat, we've got one, two, three, four, five pieces. And then obviously, that doesn't go like that, obviously. I'm just showing you the pattern. And then, then we move on to the trousers, which there's only two pieces. That's the front, or what we call the top side. And that's the underside, or the back bit, which obviously goes around there and goes underneath. And that will be going on later on. Well, it goes on as I mark out, in fact. It, it's a set piece, what we use to make sure that we've got inlay around everything. And I will start off with that, and then I'll I'll go on to the sleeve and then move on with all the bits, basically, is how it works. There's, every different firm may have different... I used to work for a company where they would cut the coat and then they'd cut the trousers. We cut all our cloth one way, which may seem a bit weird, but we like everything pointing one way. I have seen companies where they would, instead of having it all going one way, they'd put the sleeve up that way and then that one that way and then the back the other way. It's kind of an economy thing, but we don't do that. First thing, you, we want the grain running all the same way. We don't like it, you know, switching about, so to speak. If you actually look into that, there's, I call it the hole of the cloth. It's like, a, it's a bird's eye, so it's like a little, little eye. But if you look into it, there's, there's streaks in this type of cloth. And you can't help it, it's the nature of the cloth. It's not a damage. It's just a kind of streak through it and we just, that can also alter, so you, I'm, I'm looking at that making sure everything is, is going the same way. I, we don't, if a customer came in with his own cloth and he hasn't bought enough, we then say, sir, we can get the cloth out, we can get the suit out, but we can't cut it one way and then they give us permission. Some cloths shade, you see, and it's very, especially light grey checks, if you cut bits upside down, Sometimes this part of the sleeve looks grey and the back part looks sort of darker grey, so it's a bit tricky really. But we don't do that, we cut everything one way, so... With, when you're marking out, or when I mark out, I make everything, I prepare everything, as small as it may be, I make sure I've got the white and a different coloured chalk, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. That is for one purpose, and this is the main construction. So what I do now is, I will 
put my glasses on, which helps, of course, and then every point here, which I've drafted, I will mark picking up on the pattern. And then what I do is I'll actually mirror. I have to go around there like that, and then I can show you and come across there. I'm mirroring this pattern exactly onto the cloth. Hence the reason for this great big piece of metal, so that nothing moves. Then I just go around and I make sure every line continues so that I've got a habit of doing this. I like to star, most people don't, but it's just the way I like it. I like to star those corners so if the chalk comes out they can see the star because they're the most important mark on the coat. That's the shoulder line and I'm quite particular in that area. So I come around this part which is the armhole and what I'm doing is just making sure I moved it myself then so I make sure that picks up. Mark all these little details which obviously the layman doesn't mean a lot but the this area is the most important area on the coat. That's another pick up there. And then from there, slide the, this metal weight and then proceed. That's the pocket area. And then I'll follow right the way through. That's the bottom of the coat. So again, all these points, so important. We may only be an eighth of an inch or a millimetre, I'd, I work in the old style, out. But if you take it one, two, three, four, five, six, if I don't keep that exact, and you take it a centimetre or whatever you work in, um, that could end up making that coat nearly one inch too small. So I just check everything's on track, and it is. And then the reason for... Just make sure that doesn't move and that's holding exactly. The reason for that, Kirby drops on the right side. And that indicates to me how much he drops, but you have to use it. Some people use blue, yellow, it doesn't really matter for me. I have cutters that I've worked with use a certain colour for this. I, it's silly, there's only two colours that's important, that's the white and whatever you use there. That yellow is the amount of drop that Kirby actually drops. But in my fitting, I might find it's another quarter of an inch. But to start off, you've got to have some degree of drop to en enable how much more you want to pick it up or not, so to speak. So then what I do is I, I slide this pattern down so that I'm actually following the same line which enables me to get the same amount of arm hole depth as the other ones, because I've followed, I've moved the drop, that's the, how much he drops, and then always take a little slither out underneath there, because it gets balloony for some or no reason, but I've just made this, which was there, the same, but that's the drop. We don't do that there, we leave that to the tailor, because then it gets confusing. So I then put, depending on what drop, Kirby drops on the right, then I just write right on there, also put it on a ticket as well, and we just do an R there, and then the tailor knows that we've got a drop on the right side. So that's pretty standard around the West End, I would have thought. And then basically, I, then, I, then I construct my lines, which are on there, um, back onto the cloth, but then just check again. I like to keep checking, make sure it's not slid or anything. No, that's perfect. And then... Mark that dart in, and also mark that dart there. And then what we do is we just mirror in where the waistline is. That's perfect, and I like to star that as well for whatever reason. And then, on, not on that pattern, I like to look at the what cloth I'm dealing with, and this being virtually plain, I make a construction line opposite the armhole. And then I then decide how much angle I want on that po top pocket. I don't do it on the pattern, because if there was a check in this, 
I'd want to make sure that when I put the pocket in, the check matches up. And now this is plain, but so basically I'm, I've constructed a line across the baseline there, and then I put a slight angle on it, which is what we do. And until I mark the complete pocket, I put the front dart in, which is that. That gives us the shape, etc., like that. And then just make that pocket a little bit more bold so we can see it. And then take the suppression out, which gives us the shape. Like so. That's a, that's what we, that's, that's a dart, but that takes the suppression, builds up the chest. Then what I love to do is I then make a mark there, and then I go with... I make a the pocket for Kirby I'm not making because he's not big in the chest. So be about four and a quarter. So I like to find the centre, move it over a quarter, and then go with a four and a quarter pocket. And then that goes in there. And that goes in there. And I've, unlike perhaps a lot of uh, companies, when I, when I put this line in, this is where the lapel rolls, basically. So if I do that, and then it goes to... Obviously, that's the button, the, the one button. We're making two button for him. That line picks up on that. That's, that stops where the button is. And it's an old style. That's, that again, I put that cut in so that it keeps this all firm. It doesn't, it gives you a little bit of chest. It saves it jumping up here, which a lot of, I hate that, that look. It's got to be really boom. So that's what that neck cut is. But what I actually like, I've, I've got, um, it's my thing. I like that pocket, I like the lapel when it comes over to run across the cor corner of the lapel. I don't like having that outbreast pocket in no man's land. You know, I, I like to have the lapel coming across the quarter of it. It's just my thing. That doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just the way I like it. It's kind of a bit old style really, but for me it works. I've just mirrored, forgive me using the same thing, but that's that. It, apart from the pocket, which I'd always do based on the cloth, that is, I've just mirrored that pattern. That's the front or the fore part. And then I move on without this piece. So we, we discard that for a minute. This is the front, basically the coat, but that's the front of the jacket. And this is the panel that goes under the arm. And if without that, that's no good. So this is very important. That goes there, like so. And we pop, pop that on there. And what I'm going to do, I'm making Kirby an exact copy of the late Duke of Edinburgh, which is no vents, i.e. no one, not one in the middle or only at the side. It's a plain back. He didn't like vents at all. And basically what we're trying to create, this is exactly the cloth that he had. Also, the gentleman was a fabulous dresser. I know I should say that, but he really was. He actually had a morning suit made out of this, which is quite unique, because normally it's black or gray. But I made him a morning suit out of the bird's eye, which looked fantastic, and it was different as well. and looked great on him as well. Bird's eye, I don't know. It's one of those patterns that you think, God, I love that, or you don't. It's one of those patterns. I get more favorable comments when I show customers that, obviously, but you get some people saying, oh, I'm, no, I'm not sure about that. Not that they don't like it, but they're scared to have a suit made out of it, basically, and that's understandable based on the price. Um, it's just a great cloth. It, you can wear this with oxblood shoes, suede, black shoes to tr with a white or pale blue shirt, and then if you wore that with a cream shirt and suede shoes, it makes a, it kind of gets a different look. It's just a very versatile cloth, and it makes up beautifully too, by the way. Provoking you've got good tailors, which we have, of course. Um, so what we're going to just mirror that again, as I keep saying. Like so. And you may have noticed that I'm leaving gaps, for want of a better word. That's because in this area, I'm leaving a surplus of cloth. I'm going to leave surplus through here. 
surplus through there, surplus through there and surplus through there and obviously at the bottom in case Gobi wants it longer or indeed shorter. Um, but it's not a thing that's done to go around marking it like that. I mean, at my stage of the game, I should know where it, where it is, but if you were teaching somebody, I would make them mark that with a different colour because if they cut along there, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> but I, obviously over the years, I don't, I don't mark the inlay. I make sure that I do all, all my points the same thing, like these little marks here mean a lot. They all pick up, that picks up with that, although it's lower, there's a, there's a piece to come out of there, which is a, what it, I use it a lot. A lot of people don't use it because not sure they know how to put it in, but anyway. And that, when that takes out, that point comes down and matches everything, but it keeps it very clean through here. It's just a thing that I've kind of arrived at over the years. And I think lots of people will use that now. Again, yellow chalk. I have to do that. That bit will match that bit because that's the back panel and then we put a, an R on it. So that's the actual front and then I discard that, so to speak. Move these patterns away and just here, it's a habit of mine, I'm going to, we, you need a section of cloth to cover the front of the lapels up obviously, otherwise you see the canvas. I've always done this, I've had apprentices that don't kind of do this as amateur, it, it, it's a bit amateurish. I always do that, I make a mark there which is the same as that. I've seen them come here and they do that, and then when they got to put it on that, you've got that much missing off the bottom of the coat, so I kind of do that, which is that bit. So I kind of make a line, and then I pop this front again, or the fore part, on that line, so I know that I've got the amount there that I've got there and there. If I was to cut it there, I'm in trouble. It means I've got to buy another whole half a length of cloth. So what I do is I do that automatically, and then I pop that there, making sure I'm going to leave a section of cloth down there in case I've got to let it out or take it in. But the most important thing is that you don't lay it in like that. You make sure, or I do, that that lapel is straight down the grain. Because if you get it slightly off, then you see lots of suits, with, without being rude, with bubbles on the lapels. That's because they, they've, they've let it drift across, across the grain. So I keep, I keep that line absolutely straight down the grain. And then I follow that, leaving the inlay that I'm leaving here on there. But I know how to do that, obviously. That, that bit there is what I'm going to leave around there. So I automatically do that. Keep that, that lapel straight down the grain and I come down there and just run that off and then I do that which is very important that's telling me and indeed the tailor I want it to go that way and then invariably I might do one here in case that gets brushed out this is automatically following anyway because I've cut it with the grain so I discard that unfortunately we've got plenty of room here but we seem to have taken it all up with work thank God so if we put that there, and then I move the, this thing that's keeping the, the cloth from swivelling about, and then what I do is I fold it carefully so the chalks don't drop out, and just keep pulling, so to speak, like that. And I unroll it a bit more. And then my actual lay for this cloth is, I obviously have done this before, so... <laughs> Many times. <laughs> so what we do now is, these are the sleeves. So that's my, that's the top part of the sleeve. This is the underneath of the sleeve. But still, as you may notice, I'm just going to show you so you, you, so you know where I'm going from. I'm actually going to just dot that inlay, which I don't normally do. So you can see that then, because if I don't do that and then I put it down here, I can't, it, it wouldn't be any good. So that's kind of what, I don't actually do that, but I'll do it for, the, for this at uh, this time. And then I lay that in again, making those two points exactly in line, which means that's straight then. Although I have curved that in a bit because I didn't want to get the sleeve too fat. But And here, then I just move that like that, so we've got enough room. Then what I do is, I, I, same thing again, I make sure exactly around that pattern I'm 
like that. That's the elbow, so that's very important. Otherwise, that out, you, you, you know, it's got to fit the elbow. It's slightly out, you gotta, the sleeve goes, it kind of looks funny. So we do that. And then here, cross like that. And then I automatically just mark it, but if, if I was teaching somebody, I like, as we've got cloth, I like, that's the, that's the bottom of the sleeve in case I need to shorten it. So that, that is the length, but that's inlay, so that we're playing safe in case we have to lengthen. And then here, I'll mark it for your sake. I'd automatically just cut, but that, and then I've got to leave a section of cloth running through here, not here, not here, just there and there. So I'll just dot that to indicate that's where I'm going to leave the cloth, although I don't normally do that, but uh, we'll do it anyway. And then what we do now is mark that. I do it with an arrow. I mean, they think I'm mad, but I like it. I mean, that one didn't quite come out, so we go across there like that. Keep flipping. And, this, and when I get to there, I'll flip the whole lot because I want to now start the other end. There's plenty of cloth, by the way. We bought plenty in case we need to muck about with it. And then what I do is I flatten that out again. I will now take the front of this, the front of this, and that's the front of the trousers, like so. But As I explained before, when they cut the cloth from the warehouse, obviously they're interested in what they do, but this can, if, you know, if they're not cutting it dead straight like they should do, you get a void, and we call that, it's, it's lame false. So in other words, I've got to have both sides the same, back sleeves, and if I were not to see that and cut something out, I'd have more inlay on one side than the other which would which would uh, really cause me a problem if I had to lengthen it um, so I've made a straight line there and I know that past that line I'll, I won't cut past that line I'll move back this way so that I don't get an, a, a piece missing out the back basically but what I'll do is to explain I normally do this I'm actually going to cut along that line and obviously dispose of that in a minute. They are now dead true. They're both the same now, you can see. I've got both sides the same, so I've got no risk of it being, you know, laying different to the other side, basically. So I would automatically do that anyway. But what I, I like to do now, as you're filming, um, I like to do this. It's a thing that I do, which looks rather strange, but I like to do that. It's all related to his figure but I'm not going to give you the secret of this one because it is a secret. <laughs> I'm going to do that. I, I actually left that too to show you. Right, I'm a great sellotape person. I should have shares really on sellotape, but I don't, I, there's two ways of doing this. I just, I'm a hands-on type of, you know, let's do it, cut, cut it now. I don't like doing it with chalk and stuff, so I'm going to do that, like so, and then I just do that, then we'll flip it, you can see I've done this before, and then we go here, Like so, do a little twirl there, because if that sticks down, you can never find the end. Smooth that out, and then I just follow my original lines. Get that bit of sellotape off there. And go down there. All I'm doing is I'm just going back to square one, basically. That's it, pop that over there. 
So that we'll dispose of in a minute. Usually I throw it on the floor but get told off, so I won't do that. Get rid of that. Cool. And then same procedure. Make sure there's no bumps, i.e. even that little slither was annoying me, so that takes care of that. And then pop that over there. Get the underside. Pop that on there. So that's exactly, then I know where to cut. Which is there. Then make my mark there. And make sure that's dead straight. And just check. Yeah, it's too high. It's too high. I'll just put a pivot on now. I don't like that, it's too high. Just squiggle that out, that's what we do. To indicate that I've dropped it down lower, just give that another squiggle. Sellotape, drive me mad, let's get that off, got it. Okay, same procedure. Whoops. Okay. That's cool. Usually you shouldn't do that really, but it cuts easier. Okay, that's great. Okay, and then get rid of that rubbish there. Good. I'll pop all that in the bin in a minute. Okay. As I say, I should have shares in sellotape. I must have a word with them. <laughs> okay. Making sure there's no bumps, obviously. Same procedure. That's cool. Right, and then we start again. But that was very important what I just put in there, but I left it on purpose just to show you basically, get rid of that. So what we do now is we're now marking the trousers and it's the same procedure. If I was teaching somebody, I would tell them to mark at, at least inch and a quarter above. But I'd obviously been doing it a few years, so kind of come second nature, same thing that this is the crease of the trousers here. So that, that's exactly in line with that, that we're not going across the grain or, or anything. Otherwise they twist. So what I do then is I do that. I measure from there to the edge of the cloth. and measure from there to, and it's absolutely bang on without, in fact it might just come over an eighth. 
and then I do the same thing basically. I, now I'm going to go around this pattern, making sure it doesn't move. This area here is the fly area, very important. Make sure it's not clumsy because we like it obviously to drape perfectly when it's being made, after it's being made. Um, those marks indicate that this has got pleats in it. Unlike what you're wearing, which obviously are chinos and stuff, they've got their more jean style no pleats, but I'm cutting an old style pattern for him, which has got a pleat. Well, old style it's not, it's traditional really. And I'll come along there. Same thing, mark the crease, come down here, and then come down there, mark that like so, and then connect not quite across I used to but I don't go quite across now I just make the pitch and then just make my little mark there and there and then get them to put stitches in I used to chalk it and if you've got some delicate cloth you can't get the chalk out so I've changed my ways in that area this bit no exactly the same that indicates there's pleat there's going to be pleats in the top um, that's great and then discard that for a minute. I think we'll get rid of that if you don't mind because I need to put a pattern on there. We'll put that in there just for a minute. Discard that like so. And then I move on to the jacket now. It's quite weird really. But before I do that, this is most essential. Some cutters just cut it. Not all, but I like to mark the bottom of, this is the bottom of the trousers and Kirby's having turn-ups and I'm quite amateur at this I like to leave a lot when I first started in the trade they said I'll leave about four and a half to five inches that's ridiculous you've only got to lengthen the trousers half an inch and you end up with hardly any inlay on the bottom I like when my trousers are finished to have at least an inch and a bit underneath in case they ever need lengthening if you haven't cleaned they shrink or whatever so I leave six inches it's my thing and also we don't skimp on on the amount of cloth we buy. That's probably why some, you know, not being rude, but probably don't leave that much because you've got to buy more cloth. Same thing, I like to do that to indicate I'm cutting it one way. That goes on over there, like so. And same thing again, because of all the years I've been doing this, I have to leave, if you can see, that's my son there, playing golf. I have to leave inlay down the back here, but I don't mark it. I know that's what I've got to leave, you know. It's, as I say, if you were starting out, possibly... Terry and I have arguments over this, I mean, like... Which is ridiculous, really. I like to do that. You'll see in a minute. He goes that way. <laughs> I'm, I just prefer doing that. And he says, you're doing it the wrong way. Like, is there a right or wrong way to sharpen a piece of chalk? But I go that way. I find, watch it again. I, I just, I just, I don't know. I, if I go that way, I chunk it. So I kind of do that, right or wrong. And let him tell me off. Who cares? <laughs> right. What I'm doing now is I'm literally, this is the back seam of the jacket, the one that runs right through. Most important. You don't make a slip up with that because it then doesn't hang particularly well. And then what I'm doing is, I'm come, that's the bottom of the jacket. Mark my pitch so that it doesn't, there's, I like one, two, three, four pitches there. This is the top of the coat, that's the shoulder line. And come down there very carefully. There's no vents here. If there was a vent on the side, we'd leave a strip down there, but this hasn't. This is not gonna have a vent. I'm doing it old style. Same thing again, where there's a void, I, I just, it's just habit. I like to do that in case the cloth gets turned around and then you're in dead trouble.
That's the front of the jacket and that panel there is the side body panel which attaches to that to make that complete front. Then we move on to the back, that's the back of the jacket and obviously without the sleeves you can't go anywhere so that's the top sleeve, that's the under sleeve. Here's all the pieces which we roll up carefully and tie up that completes the jacket, the flaps, the collar, the facing that covers the lapels, otherwise you'd see the canvas. Final stage, complete, making sure that I've not missed anything, obviously. So we finally lay, obviously to check that we've got all the pieces, which, we, which I have. And the final stage is that, get what we call fit up, which is that. And then that's rolled up carefully so we don't lose the chalk marks and Primitive though it might be, I then come over to here to use the edge of the cloth and that is then tied up. That's a completed jacket. So after John, Terry and myself have cut all the garment patterns and we've striked them all onto cloth, um, they're brought over here, which is where we have all our trimmings. So it's all the components for jackets, waistcoats, trousers, that we sort of cut appropriate bits and pieces and then they end up bundling together, which I'll just walk you through now. So this is our body canvas that goes into the main body of the jacket. Lots of cutters have different preferences for which kind of weight and composition they use. And this is our house preferred style. It's a mixture of, I think it's camel hair and wool canvas. So it's just a certain feel that we think works well with our cutting and tailoring. Then you've got the chest canvas, also sometimes people call it lapped hair, which is just sort of giving support in the chest of the jacket. And then this is demet, which goes on top of that between the wearer and the garment just for comfort more than anything else. And that will later be pad stitched to add some structure. So this demet part will also protect against the sort of if you look here, the prickly parts of the chest canvas that provide structure. And then when those two are padded together, that provides more support as a foundation for the garment. This is Silesia, a heavyweight cotton that we use for pockets and other little pieces, like perhaps holding in the armhole or around the back neck. And this is Kirby's suit that we're trimming. So it was the match body lining. And then we've got the striped the house striped sleeve lining going in as well. And the usual shoulder pads, collar canvas and collar melton which goes underneath. Finally we have 
the linen holland which is used to strengthen pockets and other parts of the garment and then the horn buttons the house style which is the two hole and silk twist for the buttonholes so I'm just going to bundle this up and those are the pieces that John struck earlier so this will have a final fabric label typed out for it and then it will be given to our coat maker so that's that so after we have the bundle here the very last thing would be the label which I'll just type over here so we have this very modern device um, back from John and Terry's school days eras but um, it's quite nice because we will type the order number the date of order the customer's name and also who cut their pattern and that will be actually inside the in breast pocket of the garment and hidden on the trousers as well So that's a complete bundle.